everybody. Welcome to another night of Blue Bookmark. We are joined by Lauren Willig tonight. We are so excited. How are you, Lauren? Good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, you'll notice we're missing Susie tonight, and she's okay. She's just a little under the weather. So everybody say a quick prayer for Susie, and if you're here, say hey, Susie. So, um, yeah, we're just really excited to have you here. I actually just finished Band of Sisters last week, and I cried. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really good. Um, oh, thank you. So that is your current release, and that's been – kind of difficult through COVID, right? Is that the first one you've released during COVID? I had a paperback reprint come out during COVID last summer, but that, you know, paperbacks are never, you know, the reprints are never as much of a big deal as the actual grand launch. So yeah, it's been, it's been strange doing this during COVID. I think the inability to, to plan and to know what's going to be happening from one month to the next is the hardest. Um, but I have been like Cassandra about this p pandemic from the beginning. So I was like, I'm doing my launch all virtual. And you know, by March, we're not, and all I, I had all these friends who were like, by March, we're gonna be back to normal. You should be planning events. I was like, no, right. and I was so glad. You know, I'm sorry that I was right. But it right. turned out that planning a virtual book tour was really the way to go. But yeah. it's such a strange new world. It is. I'm not digging it, but no. But I mean, it has opened up doors for um, probably for you all to connect more with your fans on a virtual. I mean, on a regular book tour, you all are probably so busy that it would be hard to fit in one-on-one uh, -on -one chats with smaller groups. Although actually in some ways it's the other way around. Like on the one hand, I am delighted I get to talk to people I ordinarily would never talk to. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, any author who's ever posted a tour list will tell you they always get this slew of comments after saying, but what about my town? And you just can't go everywhere. Right. Um, but, and so this way, all the people whose libraries and bookstores don't get visited can log mm -hmm. into an author event from anywhere. And that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But why do you miss is the one-on-one -on -one personal interaction yeah. and chatting. You get a book signing where people come up to get their book signed and you wind up talking about all sorts of random and fascinating things. And so that's, that's tough. And also the personal energy you get from being mm -hmm. up here in a room with people asking questions and you can see their faces yeah. um, as opposed to typing questions in chat, which, you know, I'm that so glad true. we can do this, but it's just, it's not quite the same. Right. Genuine back and forth. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I read on your, uh, your page that you went to law school. Now, yes. how did you go yeah. from law school to writing historical fiction books? Well, I mean, fate works in strange ways. So the plan was always to write historical fiction. You know, when I was six, I announced to my class that I was going to be a writer when I grew up. And I was going to write books like A Proud Taste for Scarlet and Miniver, which was about Eleanor of Aquitaine. So I had my plan. Mm -hmm. And so my cutting scheme was I was going to go to grad school and get a PhD in history so I could write absolutely accurate doorstop historical novels. You know, like those giant John Jakes books mm -hmm. or you know, Carlene Cohen's Through a Glass Darkly. I grew up in the era of the giant historical saga. You know, yeah. Colleen McCullough's The Thorn Birds, you know, they were always a thousand pages long in mass market. And you could use them as bricks if your house started to fall down. Um, so that was why I was going to do. But while I was in grad school, um, for various reasons, I realized that, you know, I had had this daydream. Oh, hi. hi. I had this wonderful daydream that, you know, I was going to be a professor during the school year and then spend those long summer vacations. Everyone knows professors get writing my you know doorstop historical fiction and then of course i got to grad school i realized a the sort of historical fiction you learn in grad school does not necessarily help you write really good novels and b that professors don't actually really get three-month vacations they're doing all sorts of stuff for their professor lives and i also realized i really hated grading student papers so i was like <laughs> okay never mind if this plan isn't gonna work i might as well just do what everyone in my family does and go to law school and at least be able to support myself so i lobbed in one application i was at harvard for grad school i lobbed in an application to harvard law thinking if I got in, I would go. If not, I would stick out the professor thing. I got in. But the twist was, while wow. I was in grad school, 
to keep myself from going crazy, I had started writing a novel. Wow, that's for- awesome. Thank you. It was a sort of Regency romance slash Scarlet Pimpernel spoof slash modern chiclet, this mashup of all the things I really just enjoyed that mm-hmm. took my mind off, like how my dissertation was not going. And <laughs> Right before I started law school, that that manuscript was making the rounds of my friends. It was basically one giant inside joke filled with like heaving bosoms and cheap jokes and all of this other fun stuff. And a friend happened to give it to an agent um, who just happened to be looking to switch from more serious fiction to lighter fiction. And the month before I started law school, I got this phone call. Hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm an agent. I want to represent you. And I spilled coffee all over myself. I thought it was like, at first I thought it was a prank. Then I thought I was going crazy. But it turned out it was real. It was real. And okay. so my second month at Harvard Law, I wound up with a two-book contract. So it was Amazing. one of these weird twists of fate. So it was always the writing first and then the law. So I, but mm-hmm. once I was at law school, right, I, I already started. So I kind of had to stick it out. So I wound up having my first book come out my 2L year and my second book come out my 3L here, and my third book come out my first week practicing as a litigator at a law firm, which was its own weird and fun experience. You had your hands full. That's amazing. Well, it's my theory of productive procrastination. I feel like if you have stuff you're trying to avoid, you get everything done more efficiently. (laughs) So I made my book deadlines because I was avoiding my contracts homework, and I got the contracts homework done while I was stuck on the book and was avoiding <laughs> that. So it actually all worked out really well. The only thing that fell through the gaps was my dissertation, which I was meant to be finishing at the same time and just did not happen. Mm. Well, have you ever felt like you wanted to write a courtroom thriller, <laughs> courtroom drama with that background? You know, I not really. <laughs> I, I was blame you. in law. Yeah, sorry. That was like, no. <laughs> I have this French teacher in uh, high school who always, when we said something horrible, we could just laugh and go, <laughs> no. And so, <laughs> oh, no moment. Yeah. But, you know, I was a kid in law school who took classes like medieval legal history. I did everything I could to avoid <laughs> learning anything about the actual law. And so I love reading other people's courtroom dramas. I'm addicted to mystery novels, particularly British mystery novels. So you know, Same. the whole like that side of stuff fascinates me, but I've never found a courtroom drama. I mean, in my book, The English Wife, there's a little bit of courtroom drama that goes on, but it's sort of a side note to the rest of the book. But I'm not, I'm not ruling out ever right. There's actually, there is a early, sorry, not early, a late 18th century court case that I am bizarrely fascinated by. And so maybe one of these days I will get around to writing about it. But really you know, if I did, I think it would be more about the characters and personalities mm-hmm. involved than the actual legal structures. That is really neat. So the research process for the books you write currently has to be pretty in depth because when I was reading Band of Sisters, there was stuff you talked about that I had never heard about. So I Googled it and I was like, wow, like there's just so much. How do you go through the start to finish of your research to getting it to pub? Well, you usually, so way, 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 way back when, when I was this, you know, wanting to be a writer teenager, I had a subscription to the writer magazine. And there was an article by John Jakes talking about how before he started writing for like a whole year, he would do nothing but immerse himself in the sources. He would just read everything he could get his hands on about his topics and wouldn't even take notes, wouldn't outline, would just read and let all seep in and infuse his characters and his stories. And that really stuck with me. And so although I've never had the luxury of a whole year to do nothing but just like read and surround myself with the sources, um, I do always try to take at least two or three months to do nothing but read everything I can get my hands on. And like him, I don't take notes or sometimes I do, but then I never find them again later because I'm not that kind of organized person. Um, mm-hmm. I'll stick little sticky notes and things. <laughs> I found that what happens is I remember the things that wind up being really vital and I forget the things that aren't, which means I resist the impulse to info dump. Because other, you know, when you're researching, it's like, oh my God, this is cool and this is cool and this is cool. I want to use it all and cram it all right. into the book. But when you're doing all your research or most of your research on the front end, by the time you get to writing the book, you've forgotten about three quarters of that stuff you were going to try to cram in. So it really, it helps prevent you from doing that. 
So I do a lot of my, I do my research up front and then I do what I think of as spot research while I'm writing because you always bump into stuff where you're like, wait, would this house in 1897 Athens have had gaslighting or would it have been electrified yet? And so it's that sort of stuff you wind mm -hmm. up sort of digging right. for in the moment. And actually, yeah. um, Band of Sisters came out of one of those digs. I was writing a book, co-writing a book with my two good friends, Beatrice Williams and Karen White. And one of our sections was set, set in World War I Picardy. And we needed to know for that chapter, again, it was one of these little details that drive you nuts, whether these characters would have had the traditional Pickard Christmas cake during the German occupation, World War I. And I was Googling, you know, Christmas customs, Picardy, World War I, and up popped a memoir by one of the members of this real Smith College Relief Unit talking about throwing Christmas parties for French villagers right behind the front lines in 1917. Yeah, my first thought was, okay, this is not about Christmas cake. This is not useful to me. And then my second thought was, oh my God, what are these smithies here doing here dressed up as Father Christmas right behind the front lines? This is amazing and crazy. And then I had to drop everything and read all about them. But so that was sort of one of those cases where we were chasing down one of these last minute details, but it led to this whole other story. That is so neat. So bringing up- That's amazing. Uh, William then White, how did you all connect? You know, through the writer circuit, Karen and Beatrice both joked that they were stalking me and I didn't know. <laughs> like Karen would just show up- Some really cool episode. stalkers. <sighs> It was very funny because they were both fans of the books and I was deeply oblivious. So there was this really well-dressed woman with really cute bags who would always show up behind me. That was Karen. And Beatrice, I thought, just randomly sat down next to me at an awards dinner, but apparently it wasn't that random. Anyway, I'm so glad they both stalked me. But we wound up hanging out at conferences together a lot <laughs> and became really good friends. Our brains just mesh somehow. And it was also, and Beatrice, when she randomly sat down next to me at the awards year, apparently not so randomly, had asked if I would read her first book overseas, which was going to come out. Amazing. Um, I know. And she, I, of course, I said yes, but you always have that little bit of, oh, God, is this going to be yeah. terrible? What if this is bad? I read it on the plane home. I was like, oh, my God, I love this book so much. I want this woman to be my new best friend. And so we mm -hmm. became really close and we also became really close with Karen. And one night we were at another one of these conferences at the bar drinking together, being like, we need to do this all the time. And then one of us, none of us remembers which one. <laughs> it's like, if we wrote a book together, we could do this all the time. And I would put a paper on barbell. And we thought this was the most brilliant <laughs> idea ever. <laughs> and strangely, it worked out. They do, we, they do pay for our barbell when we're touring. That's awesome. <laughs> and we were just talking about that earlier. Uh, Beatrice goals, writes goals. my absolute favorite trope. Historical fiction, dual timeline with a present day trying to solve something from the past. Uh, that's my favorite. No, <laughs> I also this, recommend too. The Glass Ocean to everybody. You have to read oh, it. It, it should be a movie. Should be a movie. Because Not Gerard Butler, Gerard Butler would be the perfect. Oh, I love him. Oh, Why yeah. can I not remember his name? Her present day love, love interest. <laughs> yes. Of um, uh, Langford. Um, John yeah, Langford. Uh, yes. yes. Oh, Every time that I get John and Robert confused. Yes. So when that you all write together, do you have certain pages? and uh, Or is it like we all write together? How do you all do that as a team? Well, we stumbled onto this process with the first book we wrote, which was we all met up together, even though we live in different places. So Karen came up from Atlanta and Beatrice took the train down from Connecticut. And I walked 10 blocks from my apartment because at the time I had a six month old. So they came to me and I left the kid with my mom. It was my birthday. And so, you know, they took me out for tea and scones and we sat there over like 400 pots of tea and basically plotted out the whole book. We hadn't intended to, we had meant to just sort of throw around some ideas, see if we could come up with a big plot, but our brains just mesh so well to get together. And we found ourselves building and building and writing stuff down. And the next thing we knew, we had a chapter by chapter outline, which none of us do for our own books because we're all mm -hmm. character driven and we can't outline well, but when we're together, we outline. Also, apparently tea really helps, but, and clog cream. But so, um, so we outline, we always meet up to outline together. And then when we're done outlining, when we plotted out the whole book, then we each claim a character. And so, because there are okay. always three different viewpoints. Sometimes it's three viewpoints in two time periods. 
Sometimes it's three viewpoints in three time periods, but each of us becomes one of those women. That's and really then, interesting. Yeah, so that's oh, how we that. do it. I love that. Yeah, I wasn't expecting you to say that. That's really interesting. Really? Yeah. Did you think we all worked on everything together? <laughs> I, th I Well, I kind of thought maybe like um, you each had different chapters which I guess would make sense that because they're told from that person's point of view, but. Yeah, no way. The way it works and actually in Glass Ocean, two of us wound up writing each other's characters because we write in our, our specific chapters for our viewpoint character. But in Glass Ocean, Tess and Caroline, you see them through each other's eyes. But so if mm -hmm. you're in a Tess chapter, it was the one of us who was writing Tess looking at Caroline. And so you see Caroline through her eyes and hear her through Tess's ears and vice versa with Caroline. So if the character seems a little different, it's because it's through that person's viewpoint. But we do, at the end, then we meet up again and we all read through the manuscript mm -hmm. and we all edit the whole thing together. And so like for things like that, when two of us were writing dialogue for the same characters, like mm -hmm. we would go in and sort of tweak the dialogue sometimes in the other's character to make it, more so like if I were writing one of those two, I would have gone in and fixed my character's speech in the chapter the other character, the other person had written, if that makes sense. Yeah, that is interesting. So Sadness. do you, are you on the um, year track where you publish one and you have to automatically start writing again? Or are you going to give yourself some, uh, some grace, a break? <sighs> Well, you know, I was on a year track for a very long time. And then when I got pregnant with my first child, I decided clearly this was, I was going to use my baby as an excuse to slack. So I needed to up my publication schedule. I called my agent who also didn't have kids and was like, we should double my writing schedule just so I don't slack. And because, you know, moms are the most productive people in the world. And everyone says you can write while the baby naps. And so we signed me up to write five books in two years. Yeah. And wow. it turned into a really deeply dreadful idea. And my child was not a napper. Wow. She laughed in the face of naps. And so I got a little further behind on deadlines with each book. It was a nightmare. So we moved back <laughs> once I had wrapped up the Pink Carnation series, because I had been doing a pink book a year, standalone a year, and then Team W books along with them. So I wrapped up the Pink Carnation series. And now I just do, theoretically, I'm doing a standalone a year. But this year, busy. COVID, you know, there was no right. child care. And I have a two year old. And, well, now they're three and seven. When we went into lockdown, they were two and six. So my 2022 book will now be coming out in 2023. <laughs> Understand. Can you tell us yes. the topic yeah. on it? Well, that one is sort of a prequel to Band of Sisters. I mean, it's not an actual cool. prequel. You, can read Band, you should read Band of, Band of Sisters is a standalone. But while I was writing Band of Sisters, often you'll have a character who will poke you and be like, hi, I have a story to tell you. Listen to me, <laughs> listen to me. And while I was writing Band of Sisters, that character was Mrs. Rutherford. Mrs. Rutherford. I'm excited. Really, I'm so glad. Yeah, she's the founder of the Smith College Relief Unit. And I based her on a real woman, Harriet Boyd Hawes, who was the real life founder of the Smith College Relief Unit, but who was this groundbreaking archaeologist, humanitarian, and occasional war nurse. And of course, I had to read up on the real Harriet Boyd Hawes to sort of create my fictional Mrs. Rutherford. And her past really caught my imagination because here she was, she graduated from Smith. And she went off to Greece to the American School of Classical Studies in Athens because she wanted to be an archaeologist and excavate and was told, honey, girls don't excavate. And you know, would you like to be a classics librarian? And mm -hmm. she was like, no, 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 you don't understand. Yeah. I'm here to dig. But while she was there, the Greco-Turkish War broke out. Okay. And so she wound up flunking her Red Cross class, but she had friends in high places, pulled strings, got herself sent to the front. And despite her complete failure at practical nursing, managed to be such a brilliant organizer that she was decorated by the Queen of Greece for her bravery. But then there was this weird blip. And this was what really caught my attention because a year after that, she goes off, she goes back to Greece, she digs up Crete, makes these amazing discoveries, becomes a major name in archeology. span But there's a gap year where she goes back to the United States and randomly goes and nurses with the Red Cross in the Spanish American War. And I was like, wait, what? Why is she going down to Tampa? Why Why the Spanish-American War? What drew her there? And so, you know, I have my theories about the real woman, but 
my fictionalized version of her started dropping these little hints to me about why she went, like what happened in the Greco-Turkish war that made her drop everything and go to Cuba. And so this is a book about a young woman, this idealistic wannabe archeologist whose life is torn apart in the Greco-Turkish war and then who has to redeem herself in the battlefields of Cuba. That sounds so interesting. Um, and seeing a band good, yeah. of sisters, I don't want to give any spoils, but at one point, my, I almost threw my Kindle <laughs> across the room because when it was um, in one of the letters at the end, it said found on his person. I, I knew was like, that was what you were going to no! say. <laughs> but then I kept reading. So I've but done so many angry emails <laughs> and texts about that. I'm like, you know, friends of mine would be reading the manuscript and be like, how could you do this to me? I hate you. I'm like, do you, do you know me that little? How do you not know? Me? Would I do that to you? I was living. I was living. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, 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 I honestly, I not to do you know spoiler or anything, but I will just say generally, I believe in happily ever afters, or at least that yeah. happiest ever after you can have in a given circumstance. Right. I really cannot stand authors who think that making that making something grim makes it somehow more literary mm -hmm. or serious. That drives me absolutely bonkers. Yeah. Well, and people will be like. Well, I mean, it's just, it was so unrealistic. Everything tied up in a nice bow. Well, that's what I want. I don't want to read about <laughs> crap because that's the life. I want to read about something that makes me hope and be happy. And I don't want to read about sadness. I want people to be happy in the end. So I like It's that. been one of my Pinkernation books yeah. way back when. I had my modern hero and heroine have this long discussion about this and how basically it's all a question of where you cut the narrative. That in basically, yes, life is full of crap. But if you look at most people's stories, if you find the right stopping point, you have a happily ever after. That mm -hmm. it's simply a matter of where you decide to place yeah. the boundary lines of your story. Okay. You can paint oh, like so many things as yeah. either you know a comedy or a tragedy, but it's how we choose to look at it. Yeah. So it's Pink yeah. Carnation. And that's true for a up? lot of historical fiction. Oh, okay. I just lost. <gasps> Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah. Sentence there. Oh, I was just saying because a lot of historical fictions they don't have happy endings, especially when they're set in. War times, you know, I usually I cry, yeah. I expect to cry on um, historical fiction. So I it's good that, things. you know, some of them will have happy endings. And <laughs> I will say, nice you know, things that I sort of, and in this case, I had everything handed to me on a platter because the Smith College Relief Unit, the real members of the unit left such copious letters and journals and records behind and again, I don't want to leave spoilers, but the amazing thing is like these women drive into a German invasion, like literally drive towards the invading right. army rather than away from it. And not one of them died or was even seriously injured. I mean, in real life. And in real life, there was you know a marriage that came out of their time in the Psalm. And so all of this, and again, like you were saying, people say, oh my God, that's so unrealistic. But the truth is these women did all of these daring risky things and came out unscathed. And one of them fell in love and got married. And so, I mean, the real life women. That makes it even better. Yeah. So it's Pink Carnation, is it, has it wrapped up or are you still writing on it? Well, I wrapped up with the 12th book in the series back in 2015. Like I've always reserved the right to reopen it at some point mm -hmm. if the opportunity ever arose. But I want to make sure I actually officially and formally wrap the series in case I never got a chance to go back to it. Because another one of my pet peeves, sorry, I feel like I'm airing all my peeves tonight. But one of my pet peeves <laughs> in the series, like leave you hanging mm -hmm. like you know, the 1990s dark shadows remake where it was like it cut off in the middle of a flashback we never know what happened it was so so frustrating so i sort of feel like you know yes series sometimes take pauses but if you're not sure if you're gonna be able to resume wrap it up so your readers don't go mad right and which book are you all on in your <laughs> read-along we're up to number three, uh, The Deception of the Emerald Ring, which is set in Ireland in 1803 around Robert Emmett's abortive attempt to kick the English out of Ireland. Interesting. I just picked up the first one a couple of weeks ago. So I'm oh, excited goodness. to start it. It sounds right at my alley. So I'm excited about that. Well, no, and I had so much fun writing these because these were my dissertation distraction and they were sort of oh, compounded nice. out of 
you know, Julia Quinn and Georgia Hayer and the old swashbucklers <laughs> and the Scarlet Pimpernel and all the British chiclet I was reading while I was doing my dissertation year in London, because this was the heyday of chiclet. And then for a while, the market changed again and people were like, no one wants funny. And so that I you know that was part of the reason I wrapped up the pinks. I just love now that we're in a moment where people want funny mm-hmm. again. We're suddenly they don't call it chiclet anymore, but now there are rom coms, right. which are basically right. chiclet under another name. Right. And like Julia Quinn is having a <laughs> renaissance. It just makes me so happy. Um, have you read Evie's Evie Dunmore's books? Yo, know, I haven't yet, and everyone has told me they're I need to. They're kind of funny. Them. Yeah, they're they're in that time frame. Um and kind yeah. of funny. She does have and some humor. Spikier. Yeah, she, yeah, it's cute. Um, have you seen the TV show <laughs> Harlot on Hulu? Yes, and though this is one of these where, you know, you have those shows that are just hanging over you. So we started watching this when I was eight months pregnant with my mm-hmm. second child. Mm-hmm. And we're like, you know, then I had second child who was also not a sleeper. And we wound up dropping, like, dropping watching Harlots for a while. And I've never managed to pick it back up. And, like, every three weeks, I'm like, we should really watch Harlots again. And my yeah. husband will be like, okay. And then we never do it. But yeah. I have this, you know, this incredible <laughs> plan that if my children ever sleep, at some point, I'm going to binge watch Harlots. Well, I that need a book so amazing. like that. Yeah. In and it's what that my favorite time period, period is the um the brothel you know the the body mm-hmm. house i need a historical fiction spicy like that but still good <laughs> yeah and it's i love that georgian period that you know that 18th okay. century because like it really was anything goes in so many ways i mean you get a little bit of that in some georgia hayers georgians but you know Hers are much more proper. You do not cross the bedroom door. I'm trying to think if there are any good 18th century books. There's one by Carol Nelson Douglas called Lady Rogue, which is a lot of fun. It's 1790s, so a little later than Harlot's. But yeah, yeah, it's really, you know, when I try to think about it, a lot of the books set in that time period are the depressing morality tale books. Mm -hmm. Like there was that book called, I think it was called, oh gosh, not Slattern, but it had a name like that. It came out when I was in grad school and about this woman who goes to London and becomes a prostitute and of course gets venereal disease and dies. Oh and gosh. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it was that time period in that moment, but it was the depressing version. Mm-hmm. And you know, it would be nice to read the non-depressing version. Right. Which is basically what Harlots is. Yeah, yes. it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> so is your favorite type of book to read like a historical fiction Regency romance era? Or well, totally I read I read all across the board. I like to joke I read anything except science fiction, but I've even read okay. some of that because you know friends will recommend to me like because I'm actually I'm a very voice driven and character driven reader, and so if the voice connects with me, I will mm-hmm. read it no matter what genre it's in. But if the voice is flat, even if it's the best plot idea in the world mm-hmm. in a time period I adore, I can't. I just can't, and that's so hard. Um, but I read, I've actually been reading a ton of mystery. I've always been a mystery reader as well as a romance and historical fiction mm-hmm. reader. And I've just found it so incredibly reassuring during the pandemic because with mysteries, mm-hmm. you always know that justice is served in the end right? and that the world will be returned to rights. <laughs> and, yes. you know, in our own world where everything is so uncertain and open-ended right now, I just love knowing that by the end of the book, the knitting spinster will have solved the crime. So are you a British mystery fan? <laughs> Yes. yes, although I've been, cheating, I've been cheating <laughs> on the book mysteries a little mm-hmm. bit recently with um, Mary Robert Reinhardt, who's called the American Agatha Christie, and her books are very mannered, but I think that, you know, I bounced off them before the pandemic when a friend recommended them, and then refound them during the pandemic. I think that's that mannered thing that bothered me before is exactly why I'm liking right now, because they feel so predictable, and that's so calming. But mostly, I love British mysteries, and I watch a ton of British police procedurals. Like, that my daughter my is about dead people dying, uh, British people dying. <laughs> Yeah, British uh, police procedural <laughs> is my favorite type of like thriller, mystery, subgenre. I love it. Can't get enough. They do it so yes, well. Yes. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So I'm trying to think. I just finished up um, The Missing Presumed by Susie Steiner. Oh, well, I read three. those two. Those were good. Oh, wait, those is there a third one now? She came up with the third one. 
remain silent. It was really good. Okay, yeah, because I read the first two when I was nursing my son back, you know, I guess three years ago. So I remember the sort of the vague fever dream reading when you're nursing at 3 a.m. and you're like mm -hmm. totally in the world of books. <laughs> my son has a Kindle-shaped dent in his head is the family joke. <laughs> but yeah, I really enjoyed those. Yeah, and Fiona Barton, <laughs> all of hers are really good too. Except hers are more from a journalist standpoint, those. but those are really good too. And have you read Ruth Galloway? No, I haven't. Really Griffiths, those are really fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Write that down. There's an on again, off again relationship that will make you want to strangle the characters like 10 books in, but they're really fun. <laughs> so do you have a favorite <laughs> fictional love interest? Like you're in love with one of the characters. Oh my gosh. Okay. So this is going to sound really weird, but I have a huge Not literary nice. crush on Lord <laughs> Peter Whimsey who um, from the Dorothy Sayers, Lord Peter Whimsey mysteries. And partially just because, you know, he is so charming and clever and erudite, but it's also, if you haven't read them, so Dorothy Sayers was a golden age mystery novelist. So, you know, 1930s, 40s, 1920s, 30s, 40s. And the first few books are just like Lord Peter, they're your, your standard British country house type mysteries. I mean, they're good, they're really good. But then she introduces this other character, a detective novelist who is in the dock for murder, a female detective novelist. And the series just explodes from there because this no novelist, Harriet Vane, Peter Whimsey falls immediately in love with her and their chemistry over a course of four books while you know they're trying to work out their issues is just amazing. So I've never been sure whether I'm in love with Lord Peter because he's just so clever or because I love the interaction between him and the heroine. Like mm -hmm. it really works. And there are all sorts of modern issues they're working out together. Like can a woman be truly independent and be with someone? And like, can you love someone without taking something away from them? So, I mean, I highly recommend, you can skip the early books in the series, they're fun, but start you start with the Harriet Vane ones, Strong Poison, <laughs> when she's in the dock for murder, and they just get better from there. But I love Lord Peter. I will definitely have to check that out. Oh, nice. <laughs> Have to check oh, them out. I love an 18th century book for you. So it's funny because I was just talking about with Kate Quinn earlier today. Um, a good friend of mine, Donna Thorland, wrote this series called Renegades of the Revolution, set, well, during the American Revolution. And the first one is called The Turncoat, and it's amazing. Wrote it down. Yay. No, I love these books. They are wonderful. There are four of them. <laughs> no. Turncoat has a special place in my heart. Sweet. Okay, so I'm going to ask one more question. Um, advice for any aspiring authors? Oh, gosh. I mean, my first and best advice is always read broadly. Read everything you can get your hands on. Read for joy. Um, don't just read what you think you should be reading. Read things you like, you know, because it all sinks in and infuses your writing style somehow. It also gives you an idea of sort of what's out there, what's in the market, what other people are reading. Um, my other advice is be kind to yourself. Let yourself play. Don't assume that everything you put on the page is what's going to stay on the page. I think sometimes the best writing is an accident that happens when you're doing the writing equivalent of doodling. Um, and I think often aspiring writers feel this tremendous pressure to get it right. There is no right. There's never a right. It's what winds up on the page. And having something on the page is better than not having something on the page. And so I think the more you give yourself license to play, the more you'll write. And also, there's no right and wrong. There's really no right and wrong. I don't care what people at conferences tell you. There is no one way to do this. So you play and figure out how you do it. And that... The way that's right for you is the way that's right. That's great. Sorry, that was love. <laughs> well, we really appreciate awesome. you that's coming nice. and talking to us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I yes. love being here. Yeah. Thank so you. Um, maybe next time you all write with the three W's, yes. we can yes. have you all come back. That would be wonderful. We can squeeze into one square. Oh, yeah. We can have up to 10 people on here. So. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> I have to admit, I've been vaguely distracted by like, how do I keep my head yeah. inside my rectangle? <laughs> right. <laughs> right, yeah. But anyway, that would be oh, wonderful. No. But anyway, team up is where we're working on our. Oh, pop back up. <laughs> yes.
But Team W is working on our fourth book right now, and that will come out in autumn 2022. Awesome. I'll have to be on the lookout for that. (laughs) I've just been approved for um, Our Woman in Moscow on NetGalley, so I will be binging that pretty soon. So Enjoy. It's great. Thank you. Well, it was so nice Mm -hmm. to meet you, and I can't wait till we can chat again. Same here. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope your third year feels better. Thank you so much. Yeah, Susie, we hope you feel better and we miss you. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Good night, everybody. Um, I don't think I have that much announcement. So we will see you next week. Bye, everybody. See you next time. Bye.